Welcome to the Stoffel Systems Insights video series. I'm Eric Stoffel, President of Stoffel Systems. Today's topic is pre-charge as used in a lithium ion battery pack. It is very important to have a pre-charge circuit in any high voltage battery pack. It greatly increases the safety of the battery pack and the longevity of the battery and the external components connected to the battery. Let me show you how. So a simplified schematic of a high voltage lithium ion battery pack consists of a stack of cells, a main disconnect switch, and external terminals. Where does the pre-charge circuit live? It lives in parallel with the main disconnect switch. And fundamentally, it consists of a smaller disconnect switch and a resistor. Sometimes a fuse as well, but I have omitted that for simplicity. So why is a pre-charge circuit necessary in the first place? Well, typically, it's because the external system connected to a lithium ion battery pack has a rather large or significant capacitance, C. This can be a three-phase motor inverter. This can be a grid tie uh, system for charging and discharging. There's a variety of power electronics and typically they have a filter capacitance for their high frequency switching. And this capacitance makes it absolutely necessary to have a pre-charge circuit. So what, let's start with the case if we did not have a pre-charge circuit, what would occur? Well, when the battery is off, all the switches are open. And say that we're sitting at a voltage of 400 volts. And the system has been off for a while, so the voltage of the capacitor is zero volts. So effectively, in this situation, there are 400 volts across this disconnect switch. And if you did not have a pre-charge system and you closed this switch in this condition, you would have a very large, what's called inrush current, because the fully charged battery would be discharging into the fully discharged capacitor. And you can have very, very high levels of current with this inrush, upwards of thousands of amps. And that can lead to all sorts of problems including sparking type failures for the main contactor here. So it could weld shut, for example, or it could lead to excess heating or damage to the capacitor bank itself. So we wanna avoid all that. And the pre-charge circuit is the best way to do that. So let's look at the alternative case, where now we have a pre-charge circuit that helps us avoid this inrush current. How does that work? Well. Instead of just closing this main disconnect contactor right away, what we do is first close this pre-charge switch so that the current flow goes through the battery, across the switch, through the resistor, and then to the capacitor. So now, instead of having a very, very large amount of current flowing, our current is limited by the resistance of this resistor. So how does that work? So let's give an example of the case where we have a battery voltage of 400 volts and a resistor of 1,000 ohms. Somewhat typical values you might see in a pre-charge system. Remember, the amount of current flowing through a circuit is the voltage divided by the resistance, Ohm's law. So in this case, we would have 400 volts divided by 1,000 ohms. So we would have 400 milliamps of current flow. That is a far more gentle situation than thousands of amps in an uncontrolled inrush. So already we're doing well. But what does it look like after we close that switch? What happens then? So if we go on over here and we plot the voltage of the capacitor, I'll use blue for this. 
Eventually, we want to charge it up to the same battery voltage so that we have no current flow through this circuit. And the way that works is at T equals zero, we close the pre-charge circuit switch and we start charging the capacitor. And it follows an RC time constant, resistor capacitor time constant, until it gets to a close enough bound with the battery voltage that we can now close the main disconnect relay or contactor and have minimal inrush current and minimal sparking and minimal thermal and uh, high current flow damage issues that we mentioned before. So how long does this curve need to charge? How long does this capacitor need to charge for us to feel comfortable closing the main contactor switch? Well, RC curves are dictated by their time constants or tau. And a time constant is determined by the resistance times the capacitance. So this is called an RC time constant. One tau or one time constant is approximately 63% of the battery voltage. Two time constants is approximately 87%. And then three time constants is approximately 95%. And on and on and on, it gets closer asymptotically to the battery voltage. So using our example again, say that we have a capacitance of 400 microfarads. This is a fairly typical capacitance you might see in an electric vehicle inverter. So if we have a 1,000 ohm resistor and 400 microfarads of capacitance, so we'll multiply 400 microfarads times 1,000 ohms, what is the time for that? Well, 1,000 times 400 micro, that is 400 milliseconds, or 4 tenths of a second. So in this situation, one time constant of this pre-charged circuit would be 400 milliseconds, two time constants would be 800 milliseconds, and three time constants would be 1200 milliseconds or 1.2 seconds. So in this situation, we would expect that in 1.2 seconds, our voltage would be within 5% of the battery voltage. So in this case, 95% of the total battery voltage. And generally speaking, that is considered enough to close the main uh, contactor for a system. Some systems you might want to select the threshold at 90% or 97%. There's some advanced calculations there. But generally speaking, three time constants or 95% is considered sufficient to close your main switch. Okay, so now that we've determined all this, we have selected a resistor of 1,000 ohms because of this time. As you can imagine, if we want the pre-charge time to be reduced, we have to select a smaller resistance value. So for example, if we wanted to select 500 ohms instead of 1,000 ohms, that would take our time constant from 400 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. And likewise, if we have an application that could accommodate a larger pre-charge time, we could choose a higher resistance value. Now you might ask, why not just choose a very small resistance value? Well, the challenge is the thermal limitation. So the heat generated in a resistor or power dissipation of that resistor is calculated by V squared over R. So if we have a 400 volt battery system and a 1000 ohm resistor, the amount of power dissipation we would see at the beginning of this pre-charge cycle would be 400 volts squared over 1000 ohms. And that would be equal to 160 watts. Now that is a very high power dissipation through a resistor. Not just the normal board mount resistor would work for this. So best practice is to use a dedicated pre-charge rated or high pulse rated resistor or a chassis mount resistor that can have significant 
overage power dissipation without being damaged. Now the good news is the heat generated, as you can imagine, is only maximized at this very first point. As the voltage delta between the battery and the capacitor decreases, so does your current flow and so does your heat generation. So if I were to plot current flow in this color, we would see a pulse of current flow here, and then it would decay according to a very similar RC curve down to essentially zero. So the heat generation is the multiplied amount by the voltage delta and the amount of current flow. So a couple other things to think about with pre-charge design. You want to enable uh, some checking in a fault system of your BMS or battery management system to ensure that everything's working as expected. So one case to consider is the case where there is now actually a short circuit across this capacitor or some sort of other fault with this external system. This actually can be a real occurrence if the polarity of the system is flipped. So for example, if someone accidentally connects the negative terminal to the positive terminal and vice versa, um, then you can essentially have a short circuit from positive to negative. And what's helpful about a pre-charge circuit is it will actually allow you to detect that. When properly coupled with a BMS, you can actually raise a fault flag to indicate that something's wrong like that. So for example, if in this scenario, we had a short circuit, instead of the current flow going like this and the voltage going rising like this, you would expect to see a current flow staying flat and then your voltage level would also stay flat or relatively flat. And that would indicate to the BMS that something's wrong because the voltage is not rising in the manner that's expected. And that alone can yield numerous safety benefits because now the battery pack will not close its main high current capable switch unless it has assessed that the output capacitor or the capacitor connected to the output of the battery pack is rising at the level expected. So you can detect short circuits. You can also detect situations where the capacitance is significantly different than you would expect. So you can have what's called a pre-charge timeout fault so that if this does not occur in the expected 1.2 seconds, perhaps if it takes more than two seconds to get above 95%, the BMS would raise a fault flag and say something's wrong with the system. There are a number of advanced topics with the pre-charge system, but these are the basics to consider when reviewing a pre-charge design. Thanks for watching. See you next time.